Rüschlikon, a tiny village on the outskirts of Zürich and one of the richest communities in Switzerland. Real estate prices are booming, unemployment virtually non-existent and social problems are few and rare. Or as the mayor puts it, Rüschlikon is a wealthy community, but they say of course you can be rich, but please don't show it. One of the 5,300 villagers of Rüschlikon is Ivan Glessenberg, CEO of the commodity giant Glencore. Last year, his company went public, earning him more than 8.8 .8 billion US dollars overnight. The next thing was surprising because we got a phone call from the tax office of the canton. They said, please be prepared to have a bank account that can accept uh, 360 million of Swiss francs. The tax revenues from Ivan Glessenberg alone produced a surplus of more than 50 million Swiss francs. So the mayor decided to lower the taxes. We proposed to reduce it uh, by 7%. But then trouble began. Meet Peter Kaddish and his wife Anna Maria. Ja, die Gemeinde wollte die Steuern um 7% senken und wir haben dann einen Vorschlag gemacht, nur um 5% zu senken. Das ist eigentlich eine kleine Nuance. Es sind doch allerdings dann diese 2% sind doch eine Million Schweizer Franken. The million Swiss francs were supposed to be used to help poor communities in Africa impacted by Glencore operations. Man wünschte dass dieses Geld zurückgegeben wird, dass dieses Geld in die Entwicklung fließt, Entwicklungshilfe fließt, dieses Geld eigentlich dahin fließt, wo es erwirtschaftet wurde von den einzelnen Arbeitern im Rohstoffhandel. In keeping with the Swiss system of direct democracy, the villagers gathered for a town hall meeting. That was a flux of people coming to our meeting room and we said, oh, okay, maybe our 280 seats that are available will not be enough. Many objected to Peter Kaddish's proposal. Some thought it was unfair to Ivan Glassenberg. When the time came to vote, the outcome was obvious. Almost everyone wanted to keep the money in Rüschlikon. The council had never to interfere or to defend our own proposal. So that were the people that took it to their own. Eigentlich das Extremste war meiner Ansicht nach, dass die Leute, die hier leben, dass man zu wenig weiß, was auf dieser Welt passiert und dass man aber trotzdem sehr stark betroffen ist. Man ist ebenso betroffen wie auf der anderen Seite die Leute, die darunter leiden. Also wir leiden nicht, weil wir viel Geld bekommen, aber wir sind auch betroffen. This is the copper belt in Zambia. Beneath the ground are the largest copper reserves in Africa, an essential commodity in the global economy. Glencoe, under Glencoe, yes. Today, virtually all Zambian copper mines are owned by multinational corporations. In 10 years, they've extracted copper worth more than 29 billion US dollars. As a country, as a nation, God has blessed us with such an abundant natural resource. Now, the paradox is that Zambia is ranked among the bottom 20 in terms of poverty, 20 poorest countries. We are wealthy, yet we are poor. The problem is no longer so much one of absolute poverty. It's become one of inequality, and Zambia is really a case in point for this. A lot of people think that we in the West have been extremely generous in the amount of foreign aid that we provide uh, to the developing countries and particularly to Africa. 
Globally, our estimate is that the amount of money flowing out of developing countries is 10 times the amount of foreign aid flowing into developing countries. I've come to Zambia to find out why this country, with its enormous wealth of natural resources, is still among the poorest in the world. Why the boom in copper prices has not reduced poverty. The same question many Zambians asked themselves in the latest election. He's on the vice president. Mr. Speaker. In October 2011, Guy Scott, who once threatened to march on the copper plants if they didn't pay their taxes, became vice president. We're aware that Africa is losing more money from tax avoidance by foreign companies every year than it's gaining from aid from the countries from which these people come. God, he gave copper to Zambia. And these people, if they don't respect the Zambian soil where there is copper, mining or any other business venture in Zambia, they should contribute. These, these mining industries, they export and we don't know where they are, what they are doing with our money. If they are exporting our minerals, the money must come back to Zambia. So the current uh, investors should wake up stand up and be counted and they should not wait for the government to push them. We don't have time pushing people. Vice President Guy Scott was born in Zambia. He studied economics at Cambridge and holds a PhD in cognitive science. It seems peculiar that you're vice president in Zambia and you're white. Well, uh, white vice presidents occur from place to place, like United States of America has got one. And uh, I don't think in the Caribbean it would be all that unusual. It's just a thing that's a bit unusual in Africa. But Africa is maybe changing. I mean, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Zambian nationalist. Why not? What else would I be? Well, uh, a, a colonial farmer exploiting something? No, no, I think a colonial farmers don't have any votes anyway, even if I wanted to stand on their ticket. And there are very few farmers here, white farmers. No, but you understand the question, I guess. I mean, it is, it is uh, from, from... Yeah, normally a white politician in an African country will be representing white minority interests. That's not the case here. I'm regarded as pro-poor, pro-unemployed, pro pro-the ordinary people of the, of the earth. This is the London Metal Exchange, where the world market price on copper is determined. Between 2001 and 2008, the price on copper nearly quadrupled. Yet, despite the boom, the foreign investors paid virtually nothing in profit tax in Zambia. One reason could be transfer pricing. Transfer pricing is uh, an enormously damaging um, phenomenon right the way across Africa. The name of the game is to shift your profits out of the high tax countries, the onshore countries such as in Africa, where the profits are actually being made, and shift them artificially into low tax countries, into tax havens uh, where they won't be taxed or won't be taxed properly. The way that this, this is done is uh, by multinational groups is that they have subsidiaries all around the world and these subsidiaries trade with each other and they can artificially manipulate the prices of these trades for bookkeeping purposes, for accounting purposes. The tax haven subsidiary will buy something cheaply and sell it on much more expensively and between that gap there's a huge profit uh, and, but they won't be taxed in the tax haven. <laughs> Much Zambian copper is not traded on the open market, but bought and sold internally within the same multinational corporations. On paper, this makes Switzerland one of the biggest importers of Zambian copper. 
Switzerland is a huge purchaser of copper out of Zambia, but that doesn't mean that the copper is shipped from Zambia to Switzerland. The documentation goes to Switzerland, but the copper goes all over uh, the world. Only a 30-minute drive from Ruschlikon is the headquarters of Glencore owner of one of the biggest mining operations in Zambia. This is where Ivan Glassenberg works. Glassenberg is the CEO of Glencore and owns 15% of its shares. And on my right, Mr. Ivan Glassenberg, our esteemed CEO. Um, it has been a very exciting period for the group. Glencore is the world's largest integrated commodities trader, with a yearly turnover on more than 180 billion US dollars, more than eight times the gross national product of Zambia. Glencore controls Mopani copper mines in Zambia through a 73% stake. All copper produced by Mopani is sold internally to Glencore in Switzerland. Despite its size, Glencore is virtually unknown to the public. In 2011, attorneys for Glencore warned news organizations in the UK that Glencore executives are extremely private individuals and any reports about their homes or private lives could pose a security risk. Your company is a major investor in the developing world. We believe developing countries need more investment, not less. Investment provides jobs, education, access to health care and improved infrastructure. We spend hundreds of millions of dollars on goods and services, as well as running schools and hospitals at many of our operations. Without foreign investment, none of this would be possible. Part of Glencore's Zambian operations have been suspended by the environmental authorities. I wish you a pleasant flight. Captain Yiga, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Vice President Guy Scott is visiting the plant and has invited me along. Residents have complained that mist containing diluted acid is drifting from the plant to their homes. This looks like something out of a bondage and discipline kit. If we carry on touring the mines like this, we'll get everything that we need for Obviously, the standards are pretty loose. On the excuse, of course, always that if you make us pay for the, if you make us spend a lot of money on anti-pollution measures, then we won't have any to spend on making more money out of copper. At the plant, I meet with the chairman of Mopani Copper Mines. When I ask him about the suspension, he seems perplexed. Well, I don't know. We are good corporate citizens. We are open in our business. We are, we are very frank when we deal with all outsiders, with um, all authorities that visit us. We open our books. Uh, we don't understand. In this particular case, the action by Zema was completely surprising. So we would like to find out why they took that action. We have challenged them on that issue, and we're expecting a response from them. After further safety measures were installed, the operation was allowed to reopen. This is not the first time the plant has come to the attention of the Zambian authorities. In 2005, acid spills from the plant contaminated drinking water in a nearby township. In 2008, a similar accident occurred sending hundreds of residents to hospital. Well, I mean, there were stages when people in towns were turning on their taps and blue water was running out. 
that had been created by pumping sulfuric acid into the uh, subsoil. And this was leaking into the town water supply and everyone was, was turning green, you know, blue. We received about 400 patients with complications of vomiting, abdominal pains, we managed them. Yeah, but it was clear that it was due to the water contamination that came from there. Supported by a $50 million loan from the EU's European Investment Bank, Glencore has doubled the production capacity at Mopani. The production of copper also emits high volumes of sulfuric dioxide and dust. Sulfur emissions can cause respiratory diseases and create acid rain that destroys vegetation. A lot of respiratory tract infection uh, cases come from Kankoya, especially when the emissions are too uh, big. You find that you get an influx of patients coming from the clinics to us. I feel it myself, the effect of the, uh, the emission of sulfur dioxide. Air pollution is regulated by WHO guidelines and limits set by the Zambian authorities. The levels are measured at four installations around the plant. The numbers are collected by Mopane officials and not made public. According to environmental groups and local residents, the undisclosed numbers prove that the pollution far exceeds both national and international standards. The air tests that have been done uh, by themselves, but also by other um, independent uh, companies, have shown that we have as much as a thousand times more uh, emission of undesirable impurities than required by WHO, the World Health Organization. We wake up all, all of us in the night and also we start coughing together with the children. We didn't even sleep. We just continue coughing if there is a bit and this the bad air comes. I asked the chairman of Mopani if it's true the air pollution from the copper plant far exceeds WHO standards. The reference point is the Zambia Environmental Management Agency, and we operate within the terms set by the Zambia Environmental Management Agency. We and each and licenses of all our operations are within those terms. So the uh, statement by the NGO, I cannot comment on it. I would suggest that in fact we refer them to the Zambia Environmental Management Agency. So it's false, it's not hundred folks above the, sometimes thousand folks above the WHO standards in air pollution out there. Well, what, what we're saying is that we operate within what the Zambia Environmental Management Agency stipulates, within the licenses that they stipulate, and we abide by those. So if other people do have cons uh, evidence of something else, I would suggest that they contact the Zambia Environmental Management Agency, who are the authority to investigate any concerns that the public may raise. I tried to obtain the figures from the measuring stations directly from Mopani and the Zambian authorities, but with no result. Finally, I contacted the head of communications at Glencore in Switzerland. The numbers that you collect, I know you have these uh, measuring stations for, for pollution around uh, Mufulira. Uh, is it possible to get those numbers from you guys? They're not public numbers. Why not? I um, mean, this is something because they aren't. This is something that is between us and the environmental regulator Yeah, in, uh, in, in Zambia. Yeah, I mean, I'm just asking about what are the emissions. You must have the yeah, most well, precise that information. Several, I, I've answered that question several times. No, you haven't answered it. You said, no. you, okay, but then I'm a bit uh, slow. What, what's the reply? The reply is that we're capturing half. The data that you're asking about is not public data. That is the reply. To understand Glencore's business practices, I've decided to look into its past. 
Glencore was founded in 1974 by American businessman Mark Rich and initially called Mark Rich & Co. AG. I've asked for an interview with Mark Rich, but received no response. Instead, I traveled to Tampa, Florida to meet Morris Weinberg, a former public prosecutor in New York. In 1983, he headed an investigation into the company's tax practices. There was a big investigation the Justice Department was doing, and in the course of that investigation, two businessmen from Texas had pled guilty. And in the course of pleading guilty, they said, hey, there's something we can tell you about some, some guy named Mark Rich. And they explained to us that they had created with Mark Rich phony deals making it appear that they had bought some foreign oil from one of Mark Rich's companies and then sold it to another company that turned out to be a Mark Rich company and by that sold it at a loss and that by doing that they had literally laundered, sent offshore close to a hundred million dollars in only about a six or seven month period. You know, from a trial perspective, if we ever tried it, we, we had all we needed. During the course of the investigation, we had learned about a series of transactions that Mark Rich had orchestrated with Iran. He arranged for the Iranians to get weapons, basically, in exchange for oil. And so we indicted him for trading with the enemy. The company and its CEO, Mark Rich, were indicted for tax evasion tax fraud and trading illegally with Iran during the hostage crisis. According to Morris Weinberg, Rich and his attorney offered a one-time payment to settle the charges. Well, he came in the office. He's a big guy. He's a really big guy, uh, Edward Bennett Williams. And everybody, all of my friends were all excited because here's the most famous lawyer in the country is coming in to meet me. And he comes in, he sits down, he puts his feet up on my desk, and we talked about baseball. And then eventually, you know, he said, well, can't, you know, something to the effect of, you know, can't we just get this resolved? You know, we'll just pay some money and, you know, it'll, it'll go away. I mean, you know, I need, and then he says, I mean, you know, I know you got a pretty good case here. You know, I know you got a pretty good case and I just want to, you know, make it go away. And I said, he's going to have to plead guilty. Um, he's going to have to plead guilty. And uh, he says, well, what do you mean? I said, I mean, he has to plead guilty and he's got to, and he's going to go to jail. And I think I probably spelled it out like J-A-I-L, jail. And he said, woo. And he said, well, why? And I, said, and, and I said, well, look, it's the biggest tax fraud in the history of the United States. If we let him go, how are we ever going to do another case? The Sambian copper mines were privatized and sold to foreign investors in 2000. It is fair to say that of all the frauds that occurred in Zambia during President Chalupa's time, the privatization of ZCCM was one of the uh, most significant. The privatization process has never been officially investigated for corruption, but the president at the time, Frederick Chalupa, was sued by the Zambian state for misappropriation of funds in the London High Court in 2007. Michael Sullivan represented Zambia in the case against Chiluba. President Chiluba was found liable in damages uh, to the Republic of Zambia uh, in the sum of $46 million for uh, conspiracy to defraud at the Republic and for breach of fiduciary duty. A very living example concerns the purchase of extravagant shoes and suits from, in particular, one named Boutique Basile in Geneva. There was spent over $1.1 million and the uh, clothes which were purchased uh, were found during uh, the investigation into state corruption. I've seen them myself. There were 11 trunks. I mean, I have the uh, list of what was um, uh, found in the, the trunks and you have um, 
206 designer suits, 185 shirts, 36 jackets, 157 trousers, and 64 pairs of shoes, uh, and 74 ties. Now, all these ties were designer ties, mainly coming from Switzerland and Italy. So um, there you have a, a, a graphic example of um, the um, nature and extent of, of the corruption. Said CCM was sold for a total of 627 million US dollars. Last year alone, the mines produced copper worth more than 6 billion US dollars. President Chaluba died in 2011. Francis Kaunda, who headed the negotiations, still lives in Zambia. In 2008, he was sentenced to two years in prison for corruption relating to the privatization of ZCCM. For half a year, I tried to get an interview. So, so you, you, you would want a payment for the interview? Yes, I would charge for it. When I declined to pay, our communication ended. Forget it. I just want you to have the opportunity because we talked about... Okay, you don't, you don't, what opportunity? If, can, can I please say something? Uh, sorry, sorry. Okay. Uh, I, I would okay. just... Okay. Oh, sorry. Okay. Any right thinking Zambian, anybody could see that what was being agreed was not transparent. Information is very important and knowledge based on information is very important. The state represented by very bribed, ignorant politicians at the very top, eh, could not legitimately act as negotiators for Zambia. From the outset, the investors had the upper hand in the sales negotiations. Copper prices had hit rock bottom and the state was running out of money. Its debt to the World Bank and the IMF was so large they could not get new loans. Zambia had its back against the wall and was forced to sell. The executive board were more and more nervous about that. So uh, uh, the board let me with no initiative but to get the money back and not to extend more credit to that country if we are not repaid or if we don't invent a scheme to be repaid. The mines was the last great resource that the state held uh, and the bank and fund were very keen uh, for, that, for the mines to be privatized. And so they made it a condition of a series of loans to Zambia uh, and a series of debt relief initiatives that the mines be privatized. Hello once again and welcome to privatization. Government appears to be committed. We will ensure as government that not only do we keep the promises, but we work as responsibly as possible to ensure that we succeed. So the IMF acted as a, uh, effectively a gatekeeper to all donors, both the bank, the fund, and all bilateral donors. We were basically under the, the, the instructions of the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. The IMF has itself has never imposed a privatization. Uh, possibly in some very limited cases, but not in the case of Zambia. But what, uh, what occurred frequently is that governments have said to their public opinion, we are privatizing because the World Bank and the IMF tell us that uh, if we don't do that, they will not finance us. But it is not correct, or it is only partially correct. Uh, uh, but it's part of the rhetoric, it's part of the, of the, for the governments of, uh, let's say, saving their face. Um, effectively, Zambia made a decision that the country was in such a desperate situation with its very high debt that it should do anything it could to please the foreigners. Uh, anything you need to do to keep the donors engaged um, and to an extent to attract investors should be done. These were very, very painful moments because we were not given the opportunity to get the correct value of our assets. If you want to have foreign investors, well, you should treat them properly uh, and not to be, let's say, more uh, demanding on them than the neighboring countries. If not, they will go to, 
to the neighboring countries. Here, a degree of wisdom is needed in the management of the countries. Today, the privatization of the copper mines, combined with the boom in prices, has revitalized the mining sector. Yet despite economic growth, unemployment remains largely unchanged. With more than 64% of the population living below the poverty line, Zambia is more than ever desperate to attract foreign investment, hoping this will create new jobs. Since we came to power, which is only six months ago, something like 150,000 people have been dumped on the jobs market. And we have certainly haven't created 150,000 jobs in the six months that we've been in power. For the investment park. Okay. Is that right? Uh, <coughs> Yes, Your Honor. More than for the mine. That's what I just clarified. I'm sorry about the Minister of Commerce. I couldn't track him down. Every speech, every every passage, every newspaper story talks about we owe the youth jobs. Unemployment, unemployment, unemployment. And you, you just can't escape it. And even the opposition now, the ones who were in government for 20 years, are now trying to tell us that we have failed because we haven't managed to create a million jobs or whatever it is. The foreign, foreign mining companies go a certain way towards that, and they'd go a lot further if they paid their tax. Mind you, you read my lips, I didn't say they're not paying tax. But if they, pay, if they were to pay more tax, they would go a very long way to indirectly creating jobs. Through our investment, we also want to, to make our due contributions to the deepening of friendship between China and Zambia. And we also want to see the friendship between the people of the two countries can be deepened through our investment because we can understand each other much better through our investment here. Um, thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much for organizing the lunch. We need Chinese lunch in Zambia more often. Our priorities in Zambia are jobs. Jobs and more jobs and taxation revenue. Because to, to provide decent living for the majority of Zambians, we have to find them something worthwhile to do. And we also have to be able to provide them with social services such as free education to secondary level and to uh, supply them with medical services. But all that takes money. And uh, thank you for coming along to supply the money. So our, our friendship, I believe it's a genuine friendship, but it's, it's based on, on material results. Your Honor, we have a, a small request. Which was uh, which? My colleagues want to take a photo with you. We don't know whether it is uh, permitted. <laughs> The first key to development in a country like Zambia, where you've got a serious unemployment problem and it's growing. I mean, I have to give my phone to my secretary every morning and keep it turned off at night because there's so many people wanting jobs and they think, I know, I've somehow got hold of the vice president's phone number and he owes me a job because I once uh, organized a rally for him in some part of the country or, or maybe he knows my brother or... or you know, there's endless people needing jobs. Any old job will do, they're so desperate. You, you, you can tell it, you can smell it, you can feel it. If you, if you keep your phone turned on, you, you hear it, you, you see it on the SMSs. Come in the whole time. I want a job, I want a job, I want a job. Thank you. Thank you. Long life for you. Well, uh, you too, we might as well, <laughs> <laughs> we might as well both enjoy it. <laughs> The lack of tax revenue from the mines has left some donor countries concerned that Zambia is not benefiting enough from its copper. At the Norwegian embassy, economists have scrutinized the numbers. Nous avions les chiffres de 2006. Alors, la valeur de l'exportation était de 3 milliards de dollars et les revenus de, de la Zambie étaient de 50 millions de dollars. 
Et encore faut-il tenir compte du fait qu'il y a des contrats de fourniture d'électricité qui coûtent au gouvernement zambien 150 millions de dollars. Donc, ils étaient en perte. A World Bank report from 2011 states that Zambia is losing money on the production of electricity and that the rates paid only capture 40% of historic costs. According to the mining companies, there's a simple explanation to why they've hardly paid any profit tax. What am I saying? What I'm saying is that a number of companies had carry over tax losses. That's one. Then two, because the productive infrastructure had deteriorated, dilapidated so badly, it required huge investment to bring the production up. The production now is over 700, but over $5 billion has been, in, 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 has, has been injected, has been invested in plant rehabilitations, plant expansions, and new facilities. According to the Norwegian findings, Zambia was hardly benefiting from the extraction of copper. In 2007, the tax revenue from the mining sector amounted to only 0.2% of the gross national product, while at the same time, copper made up nearly 71% of Zambia's exports. En regardant ces contrats, nous nous sommes aperçus des graves anomalies. Je suis allé à Lusaka. Je suis allé devant l'Assemblée nationale pour dire « c'est votre affaire, mais si vous le demandez, si vous et votre gouvernement vous le demandez, nous, communauté internationale, sous leadership norvégien, nous sommes d'accord pour financer euh, les experts. » Sampien président Levi Moinamwasa took the advice and ordered a revision of the sales agreements and the Sambian tax laws. Nous avons lancé un grand concours international pour trouver les meilleurs, les meilleurs lobbyistes et les meilleurs experts fiscaux. Ils ont conclu que les contrats étaient léonins, qu'ils n'avaient pas de valeur, et du coup, ils ont créé un nouveau statut fiscal pour permettre euh, aux Sambiens de bénéficier de l'envol du prix du cuivre. In April 2008, the Zambian government cancelled the conditions in the original sales agreements and introduced a new tax regime. The mining companies, uh, it would be uh, um, an understatement uh, to say that they didn't like it. <laughs> they went uh, bananas uh, and they uh, threatened with uh, 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 international uh, courts and, uh, and the like. They introduced the um, taxation levels which were going to put mining companies out of, out of business. So it was complicated from the two sides. From the mining company's point of view, it, it, the effective tax rate was too high. From the other stakeholders, the, the, the Zambian people, it was a welcome move because it was going to mop up a lot of money which would have been used for other development. The mining companies, all except one, refused to accept the new legislation and withheld payments. Malheureusement, Mbasa Levy is dead, and Banda is venu au pouvoir, and Banda n'avait pas la même conception de l'éthique ou de l'anticorruption euh, que Levy, and he n'a pas tenu tête aux multinationales. Et du coup, le régime fiscal n'a pas été appliqué comme il aurait dû l'être. Legislation is not the only challenge. Sophisticated tax planning is today making it possible for multinational companies to reduce their tax payments, moving profits out of the country. The phenomenon is simply rife all the way across Africa and indeed the rest of the developing world. In Africa, you see a particular focus um, in commodity markets. Africa's natural resources are being extracted frequently without countries and citizens of those countries getting their fair share. In 2008, 
If Zambia had received for its copper exports the same price that Switzerland declared for its copper exports in the same quite detailed commodity categories, Zambia's GDP would have nearly doubled that year. And this is in a country where something like 80% of people are living on um, less than $2 a day. The impact of GDP potentially being $25 billion rather than $14 billion could have been enormous on development. We in the Western countries have created the mechanisms by which this money flows, um, and it flows into our own coffers, and therefore we have as much responsibility as the, uh, uh, as the poorer countries uh, to try to curtail this phenomenon. In many cases, the methods used for paying less tax is almost impossible for developing countries to scrutinize. Transfer pricing is inherently complex, and the, the OECD model, which is the unfortunately perhaps the dominant model um, to work out what a fair price is for trade between two subsidiaries of the same multinational, um, that process is very complex. Now, what you find in a low-income country, um, uh, as Zambia was until recently, is that the capacity within the tax authority to deal with the complexity and to deal with the army of lawyers and accountants that a multinational company has at their disposal simply isn't there. So a multinational company like Glencore is able to resource um, their ability to defend a particular set of prices in a way that the Zambian tax authority finds extremely difficult to respond to. I, I've spent my whole career looking at this, and yes, I'm on the OECD Task Force on Tax and Development, um, but by and large, I find that the OECD is not interested, not interested at all in debating the broader subject. Their interest is in protecting their guidelines because OECD countries want to maintain the status quo. Glencore's history of legal problems are remarkable. In 1983, the company's founder, Mark Rich, fled the United States to avoid jail. The US authorities reacted promptly, putting him on FBI's top 10 most wanted list. He decided he didn't want to go to jail, he felt like he was above the law, and therefore he was going to do every he you know he had more money than anybody and he was going to do everything he could to try to you know to try to beat this mark rich because of his flight from the united states became the most wanted white collar criminal in american history switzerland refused to extradite him to the us but he risked apprehension every time he set foot outside of switzerland Rich tried a different tech. He hired then President Bill Clinton's former White House counsel, Jack Quinn, to secure a pardon for him. His wife, Denise Rich, was responsible for providing more than a million dollars to the Democratic Party. She also donated an undisclosed amount to the Clinton Presidential Library. Among others, Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Barak, as well as the King of Spain, personally telephoned President Clinton, encouraging him to grant Mark Rich a presidential pardon. I'm a Democrat. I grew up in Tennessee. I worked for Al Gore's father. Al Gore himself was an old friend. We'd gone to law school together. And I was devastated by what had happened in Bush Gore. And so one of the worst days of my life, really, was the inauguration of George Bush and so I, I don't want to have anything to do with the inauguration. I'm sitting at home and I get a call, telephone call. And it's Michael Isakoff, who's a well-known reporter, who I knew somewhat. And he says, what'd you think about the pardon? And I said, what, Milken? Milken got, because you know, the, the, the publicity was, is that Milken was, and he said, no, 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 Mark Rich. And I said, I cursed. I said, no effing way. And he said, no, Mark Rich. I said, well, what about Pinky Green? He said, who's Pinky Green? I said, well, that's his partner. Did he get pardoned too? And he goes down the list. You can hear he said, yeah, he got pardoned too. I said, good Lord. 
I was in Paris, working in Paris when the pardon was, was published, and I wasn't surprised. I was a little bit shell-shocked on how blatant it had been carried out. I thought it would have been done with a little bit more panache. How do you pardon a person who thumbed his nose at the American system? You know, if he came back, if he thought he had such a good defense, come back and fight it. You put, uh, put your defense on him. He never did that. He was a fugitive. And he renounced his American citizenship. If you renounce your American citizenship and you're a fugitive, you don't deserve to be pardoned. Certainly not in a case where you committed the biggest tax fraud in the history of the United States up until that time and your companies pled guilty to it. Ivan Glassenberg joined the company just as Mark Rich fled to Switzerland. Glassenberg's first post was as a coal trader in Johannesburg. At that time, the company's core business was providing oil to the apartheid regime in South Africa. From his exile in Switzerland, Mark Rich made an estimated 2 billion US dollars selling oil to South Africa before and during the UN embargo. In 1991, Ivan Glassenberg had caught Mark Rich's attention and was brought to the headquarters in Switzerland. Over the next couple of years, Ivan Glassenberg became a trusted member of the inner circle, known as the Rich Boys. The pardon of Mark Rich did not include the company. The companies pled guilty and um, uh, it was signed, sealed and delivered. And, and when we were in court, when this happened, it was like a closing. Because the way in which the monies were paid included Mark Rich selling his interest in 20th Century Fox and some um, oil wells and stuff, which generated cash that was then delivered to us. To, to satisfy the $200 million. We were all collected in a back room in the court, signing, you know, signing papers like a, you know, like a closing is really what it was. And then, you know, that was it. Case was over. One year after his flight, the company Mark Rich & Co. pled guilty to tax fraud. They did act like, from day one, that they were above the law. Every time I turned around, his company and people for his company were cheating and were breaking the law, whether it was doing a midnight sale that was bogus or trying to secrete documents out of the United States or, or um, cheating on taxes or, or making up phony deals to launder money out of the United States or doing deals with the Iranians when they were prohibited. Whatever it was, he was cheating. In 1994, Mark Rich stepped down as CEO and sold his shares to the management. The company was renamed Glencore. In 2004, Ivan Glassenberg took over. Today, Chairman Simon Murray assures that Glencore is involved in no illegal activities. Our position on the issues of bribery and corruption is clear. Offering, paying, authorizing, soliciting, or accepting bribes is totally unacceptable to Glencore. At the time Simon Murray made these assurances to the shareholders, Glencore's grain division and two of its employees were standing trial in a Belgian court, charged with bribing a European Union official. Please don't feel. Everything is presumed innocent, uh, we don't like it. For two years, Glencore had supplied EU official Carol Bruce with cash, travel and a free phone. All in exchange for inside information. Information Glencore used to secure EU export refunds. A lucrative arrangement making millions for Glencore. On June 27, 2012, Glencore's grain division was found guilty and fined 500,000 euros. Glencore has appealed and declines to comment. 
Glencore has full oversight of its tax practices and fully adheres to all its tax obligations in line with the laws in the countries and the ter- ter- territories in which we operate. A confidential report leaked in January 2011 raises serious questions about Glencore's tax practices in Zambia. The report contains the results of a comprehensive tax inspection of Glencore's Zambian subsidiary, Mopani Copper Mines. There it is. Uh, I got a brown envelope from my, in my email. It's here, and um, I mean, it was a very simple envelope, nothing specified on it, just my address. Uh, and uh, inside, there was a pilot audit of the Mopani Copper Mine. Who sent it to you? I don't know. You don't know who sent it to you? No, I don't know because I think uh, that it wasn't meant to be public. Financed by a group of donor countries led by Norway, Zambia had hired the international audit firm Grant Thornton to carry out the audit. Pas simplement la, la sous-facturation, la, la manipulation des résultats, il y avait aussi le fait que des pans entiers Euh, qui aurait dû figurer dans les chiffres d'affaires était complètement occulté. The purpose of the audit was to establish if Mopani's tax payments for 2006 and 2007 had been correct. The auditors found strong indications of transfer pricing and noted that prices seemed to be determined by the parent company, i.e. the purchaser. This, concludes the auditors, was not in accordance with the arm's length principle. In other words, Glencoe in Switzerland appeared to have been manipulating copper prices and as a result reduced its tax bill in Zambia. That situation is not correct. We deal with Glencoe at arm's length and we are paid at prices that relate to the London Metal Exchange. Based on the findings, the auditors concluded that Glencore had traded with its subsidiary in breach of the OECD's arm's length principle and that this should have an impact on the tax assessments for the period under review. It was a report that contained uh, issues that were not factual. That report was a desktop uh, report it had a fundamental flaw in the sense that the auditors did not uh, familiarize themselves with the chain of production. According to the auditors, Mopani had resisted the audit at every stage and did not appear to be concerned of any sanctions that might come. If a similar uh, audit report had been carried out for the tax authority in the UK, for example, then I think you would very quickly have seen, um, as, a, as a first step, I think you would have seen a threat of proceedings simply on the grounds of non-cooperation, even before we start looking um, at the potential for redress, given the apparent scale um, of distortion uh, in the way that um, the mine has been operated. We were very cooperative to Grant Thornton and ZRIA. In fact, at the end of the audit, we received a letter from ZRIA commending Mopani for being so cooperative. After the report was leaked, the EU's European Investment Bank suspended any further loans to Glencore. In Zambia, the finance minister called for the company to pay what it owed, but Glencore has refused. One Zambian charity has reported Glencore to the OECD. Under the OECD, you, there is um, a complaint mechanism where you can actually file a complaint against a company for violating uh, tax-related uh, guidelines, which we did. So what has come out of that? Nothing. Because Glencore refused and or the OECD said they can't do anything if one party does not want to cooperate. For six months, I've tried to get an interview with Ivan Glassenberg, but he has declined. In a written response to the audit, Glencore rejects all its findings. The issue remains unresolved.
You, know, you don't have crack squads of auditors and accountants and computer operators and people who can parachute in and open a safe and fly back again and give us the information about who's hiding what. So you're just trying to do the best you can do. And that's what we're doing. And I hope we get better at it. I can't jump out of this chair, run through the door, grab my AK-47 from my car, and rush off and accost the nearest miner. You know, it just takes a bit of time. It may take more time than people are prepared to explore it. Zambia sold its copper at the worst possible time, on terms that made it difficult for the country to benefit from its own natural wealth. Today, the government is working to increase tax revenue from the mines, revenue badly needed to pay for schools, health care, and to reduce poverty. The leak of the audit report did not upset the market. In May 2011, Glencore raised over 10 billion US dollars, making it the world's largest IPO that year. Buyers included the Church of England and the Norwegian government through its oil fund. Um, it has been a very exciting period for the group. It saw the successful IPO offering the largest ever IPO on the premium segment of the London Stock Exchange <clears throat> and the first ever simultaneous London primary and Hong Kong secondary IPO. Ivan Glassenberg made 8.8 .8 billion US dollars on the IPO. 400 other Glencore employees made more than 100 million dollars each. In late 2012, former British Prime Minister Tony Blair was brought in to help negotiate an $80 billion merger between Glencore and the mining giant Extrata. If successful, the merger will almost double the company's size and influence in the world. 